That's all the announcements to be made known. We're going to go ahead and take this morning's tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. I read recently about the second largest diamond that's ever been found. It is 2,400 carat stone. It's found in Botswana. Uh, and it's owned by a mine of a Canadian company. And they say here is that this is, again, the second largest diamond that's ever found. But interesting is a Canadian company went to another country to find this carrot. I mean, I found that kind of interesting because you think about it, uh, a foreigner, if you will, found something in another land. And it wasn't the Botswana people that found this gem. It was a, a Canadian. The Bible tells us about what you find in other areas in Matthew 13, 44. is the parable of the hidden treasure. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then it was joy when he went and sold all he had and bought that field. So you think about this for a moment. There's treasure in a field. And he goes ahead and he finds this jewel, if you will, this diamond. And he said, after he found that, he said, I'm going to go ahead and sell everything I have so I can buy this land. So this was not his land. Okay, He didn't own this land. He wasn't inherited to him. It wasn't uh, his, his uncle, rich uncle, did not die and hand over a couple acres to him. He went ahead and found something. But the key to this is that somebody else owned that field. But it took somebody to see that there was treasure inside of it. The kingdom of God is that way. When you are willing to put God first, when you are willing to learn this lesson, is that I will do everything I can to get that. And that is where you find the treasure of God. And he says here, when he bought this field, he sold everything. He didn't say he was broke. He didn't say that he was mad. He didn't say that, oh, my life is over. At that moment, he said joy came into his life. So that's what it costs. I'm telling you, serve God with everything you've got. Give with everything you have. And watch God bless your life. And you'll have joy. Joy. Amen. Because that's what God gives us. Let's go ahead and pray for this offering. And then we'll go ahead and sing a song. So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for this opportunity to give, Lord. We pray your hand be upon both gift and giver. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing the song, I Saw the Light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Hallelujah. Thank you. All those on the platform. God is good. Amen. All right, so all the kids heading downstairs. Don't worry, they're not taking them somewhere crazy. This is a children's church. That's where they're going. But man, where are all these kids going off to, you know? So um, if you have your Bibles, you're turning me to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 22. Judges 6, 22. Amen. We serve a really good God. I entitled this sermon, 90 Seconds to Live. And we're going to get into what that means. There's a Greek mythology about a Greek god named Pa or Pan. They say his, uh, what he does is this god lives in the woods, fields, flocks, and shepherds. And he lives in caves and he roams the valleys and mountains. What he does all day is he dances and he hunts. And what also he does is that when people go to the forest at night in the darkness and solitude, he strikes them with fear. And his name is Pan, so that's where the word panic comes from. How many understand that people, they panic? We all panic sometimes. How many don't understand that, right? But if you think about this word panic, it comes as a rush. Sometimes you're, you're, you're trembling in fear. Dangers bring panic. And one thing that happens is that we suffer ourselves with people around us suffer. And then ultimately, our spiritual life suffers. 90 seconds to live. I'm going to get into what that means as we read in our text. We're going to be looking at a, a familiar portion of scripture about Gideon. 
And Gideon in our Bible, he's chosen by God to do something incredible, but there's some enemies that are around him, and it can cause a panic when the enemy surrounds us. So let's go ahead and read just a couple of verses here, Joshua, I mean Judges 6, starting in verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Oprah. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. It says God to help us. Uh, hallelujah, God. We thank you for the blood, God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I pray your hand be upon us, God, this morning. God, people that are stricken with panic, uh, anxiety, and fear, God, I pray you would break through, God. Show them that perfect peace is found in your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at fight or flight. We all have heard of that before. Because many people, it's called the panic flight. You look into this. It's called when your body, uh, it's a response when there's an intense physical symptom. So what happens is when you are, uh, you know, uh, let's say a grizzly bear comes up to you. I don't know anybody here got, you know, bear spray or you got a, some kind of gun. Uh, uh, I don't know what you got, but it makes people a little bit nervous, obviously, if you got a raging bear coming at you. So what happens in your body is a hormone starts to release in your bloodstream. And it makes you go into high alert. Your heartbeat starts to pound and your blood starts to, to tense up and your muscles start to, to go into a moment where it needs to do something. And you know what? Our response exists today. What it does is panic flight. It's meant to keep you safe. It's meant to prepare you when you're about to escape or hide from danger. And what takes place is a true nature of you comes out during the most panic moments in life. Like I said, you either fight or you flight or fight. So these people in our situations, what happens is, is when you come into a, an area in the life where you are stricken by a grizzly bear coming up to you, you're either going to say everything will be okay or this is the last day I'm going to live on earth. So the Bible tells us a few things about people who are needing to know who God is. First off, Jeremiah 31, 35 says, this is what the Lord says. He will appoint the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that this waves roar. The Almighty is his name. Psalms 139, verse 9 says, If I rise in the wings of dawn, if I set on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. See, we know this. The Bible gives us truths about being secure in God. To know that we can be safe under the shadow of His wings. But the reality is, we can be still stricken by panic. We have to know first and foremost who God is. And how do you respond when you've never been in a situation before? Some people never been in a rollover car crash. You don't know what to do. Most people never been in a burning plane before. You got no idea how you're going to escape. If you ever been in a, a shopping center or some kind of mall and they have all the exit signs, you know, and you say, what am I really going to do if something were to going to happen? We see the exit signs. We know. But the reality is you're going to see real people do something. And this this uh, sermon comes out of a book I was reading, and it calls uh, the survival book. And it talks about all these people that have uh, survived burning plane crashes or, uh, you know, uh, car accidents or almost drowning. And it says what they actually do to survive. And they have a rule of thumb. It says you have only 90 seconds to survive a very traumatic situation. That's only a minute and a half. So in our text, I'm going to give you a little backstory about what takes place. Because we're looking at Gideon. What recently happened is for seven years, Gideon, the people of the Israelites, they're living under the oppression of a, a group of people called the Midianites. The Bible says is they, they oppressed them. They overpowered them. And then what they would do, the Israelites would plant gardens. They would plant, you know, things to eat. And they would have their sheep, their cattle. And they would do all these things to live. 
But then after they would get everything settled, they would all be okay. They would say, okay, we're living in peace now. The Bible says that these Midianites would come out of nowhere. It says in Judges 6, 5, they came up from the livestock like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them. They would invade the land and ravage it. They impoverished the Israelites, and that is when they cried out for help. So we have here is that every time they would get comfortable, every time they would feel like they're in peace, panic would strike. They'd be tormented day and night, not knowing when the enemy would come up. And the Bible tells us that this should not have happened. They should have drove these people out a long time ago. They should be no more locusts in the land. But the reality is they were still there and they oppressed them, meaning that they squished them. That they felt like somebody was pushing their head down underneath water. And if anybody in here knows what panic or even depression or even anxiety feels like, that's exactly what it feels. It feels like somebody just compressing you and you have no idea what you're going to do. So in the Bible, Gideon here, what happens is, is God picks a man that can do something. And he says, I, I, I'm going to go to Gideon. I know he's a mighty warrior. And he goes up to Gideon. He says, what are you going to do? And in Judges 6.14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength. You have to save Israel out of the Midian hand. I am sending you. And this is what Gideon says. Pardon me, my Lord. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest. And I am the least in my family. See what happens when panic is living inside of you. When fear lives inside of you. You feel like you are the smallest. You feel like you are the weakest. You have no dominion. You feel like you are the weakest instead of the strongest. The Bible tells us when the Israelites were meant to take over the land of Canaan, if you know your Bible, they said as they went to the land for 40 days, they wandered, they got the grapes, but when they came back, they said, how was it? And they said, oh man, it's a beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here are the grapes to prove it. But then they said, but the people there are massive, they're giants, and we are like grasshoppers. See, this is what panic does to a Christian. I ask you today, are you calm? Are you living in fear? Do you live in fear of what's going to happen tomorrow when tomorrow I didn't even come? Gideon says, how can I do this? I'm weak. I'm insignificant. And people living in weakness, fear is so easy to come into your blood veins. It's so easy to live inside of you. And what happens is when you live in fear, when you live in this lifestyle, you make wrong decisions. You start thinking, oh, well, God's not really going to help me. I'll find my avenue in other areas in life. And that's exactly what happened to the, to the Israelites. It says in Judges 6.10, this is what happens after they came out and swarmed them like locusts. Uh, every time they would be settled, this is what they did. It says, I said to you, I'm the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of Amorites in the land you live, but you have not listened to me. This is what happened to them. They felt like they could not trust God anymore. They felt like God was not their protector. So they started to worship a false God. And I want to say right now, when you worship something fake, you won't have real substance of having the dominion that you need to live life. If you start worshiping what the world gives you, you're always going to be seeking the anxiety pills. You're always going to be seeking the marijuana to make you doze off a little bit. Uh, you're always going to be taking a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake uh, so you can feel a little bit better to calm down. That's what the world's answers are. But when you understand who God is, that's when everything changes. Because in our Bible... Gideon calls God Jehovah Shalom. Shalom means peace. It means confidence. It means everything that you need in a God. But Gideon did not see him first as Jehovah Shalom. He saw him as a Jehovah weak, meaning that Jehovah could not help him. That means when he's in reprieve, he feels like a man floating in an ocean that has no fresh water, but only salt water. To live by. Let's talk real quickly about Jehovah Shalom. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the Bible very quickly, okay? 
So follow along. The Bible, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. It's a very, very old language. So when they wrote the word Jehovah, it was actually spelled Y-H-W-H. And it pronounced as Yahweh. And in other translations, it would say Jehovah. But I want to say something very quickly. Y-H-W-H, how would you get the word Yahweh from that? So what happens was, is that the, the people of Israel, they were afraid to say the word Yahweh. So they spelled it this way where they would not pronounce his name wrong because they were fearful of saying God's names wrong. Follow along. And this is what happens when you don't really know God. How many know? You need to know how to say God. You need to know how to say Jehovah. You need to know how to say who He is. You can't live in fear of a God that's meant to be Shalom. So this is what I find so interesting in our text is that God's saying, peace, brother. I'm right here. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. And that is when Gideon said, you are the God of peace. The reason why he said that, he made that statement, is because he met an angel of God. And back then, they said if you met an angel, you're dead. You're dead, man. Like you would not live after you meet an angel. So that is why he says, when I, up until this point, no generation has ever seen an angel and lived. No ever generation has ever seen God face to face and live. So at this moment, Gideon is finally seeing God's face. And that is when he says, oh, I lived. I didn't die. God didn't kill me. And, when, and better yet, these uh, bad guys, these Amorites, these Midianites didn't kill me. My enemy did not kill me. God is my shalom. Judges 6.11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak of Oprah and belonged to Joash. And where his son Gideon was threshing fleet in the wine press to keep from the Midianites. I want to talk real quickly about Gideon for a moment because like I'm bringing up to this point is that Gideon is meeting God face to face. And he's like, oh, you are the God of peace. But before that, when he was living in oppression, he said here, I come to see a warrior that could set my people and deliver them. But when God met him, he wasn't having a sword fighting the enemy. He wasn't there with this shield, you know, thinking stabbing guys and, you know, taking out bad people. He was, they, he said, threshing wheat. That don't sound like a warrior to me, okay? That sounds like somebody who's just pushing a broom around. And this is the effects of being an absent warrior. So in your life personally. When you are an absent warrior, when you don't think God is really God, when you live in fear, when you think that, man, my life is over, nothing's going to help, these are the effects of that. First off, you don't pray anymore. Luke 18, 1, it says, Jesus told his disciples a parable, a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. See, when you feel like God's in control, you don't pray. Because what prayer does is you're allowing God to come into your life. You're allowing God to take center stage in your situation. Because when you don't pray, that means you got it. You know, you say, I got it. Now, you don't need to help me, God. I can do this. But prayer, as a Christian, it is the number one tool to build up your house. Prayer is meant to uplift God, thank Him, and lift up your situations in your life. The second thing is when you are absent warrior is you don't seek God any longer. Psalms 105 verse 3 it says, Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. When you know how to seek God, you find strength in Him. You find the, everything that you lack in life, you find it in God. But when you always rely on yourself, you don't think that way. We don't think God is in control. We don't understand that He has all power and all authority. And lastly is that we don't do spiritual things anymore. Psalms 84, 1, it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. See, that's what the heart of a Christian is. You always see God. 
No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what is pressuring you to give up, to quit, to throw in the towel, you always need to seek God. Always. That needs to be your number one answer in life. Thank God you all came today, right? You came on this Sunday morning. Glory, I hope you come tonight. Well, what happens tomorrow? What are you going to do Monday? What are you going to do Tuesday, Wednesday? We could go on and on, right? What are you going to do from the day on? You always, he says, seek God. Always. There's a story of someone who doesn't do these things and uh, they don't seek God. It goes on to say as a metaphor, when you keep digging, things get a lot worse. There's a man named uh, Schmidt and he spent 32 years hand gouging a tunnel in the side of a mountain. He says he started in 1938 at the age of 67, and 16 years later, his legacy was digging a half a mile inside of a, a tunnel. I don't know about you, that don't sound like a good life to me, but you know what? When you don't know how to see God, you keep digging in the wrong places. You keep digging and say, oh, it's going to get better, but you're doing it on your own. You're living your life on your own means. You're not really getting God involved. You're not allowing Him to take center stage in your life. Again, this is Gideon. Gideon is a man. He, he, God came to him and said, I got a, you're a mighty warrior. But what he was doing, he was threshing the floor, man. This guy had a little, you know, a little rake and he's moving, you know what I mean? Imagine a man, you know what I mean, with a big sword on his back and he just out here with a broom like, yeah, you know, just living life, you know. Not much getting better, just doing my daily activities here. But God, what he saw is a mighty warrior. That he could do something. So I close with this. It's the survival formula. Because you want to know how to survive fear. You want to know how to survive living in anxiety. Listen, if you take anxiety pills, I'm telling you, God can set you free. If you are living in depression, God can set you free. God can give you more joy than you can imagine. But there are things that you can do in your life. The number one thing is to call the survivor gene. This means inside of you is the willingness to fight. You're not weak. People think, oh man, I can't do it. I can't go on another day. I can't see how I can live through these Midianites always attacking me. You think your own life, how can I overcome financial difficulties? How can I overcome family members who are always bagging on me? Uh, how can I overcome the hard workplace or bills and this and that and the other? How can I really live this life when temptation is always bothering me? First and foremost, you need to know that you need a willingness to fight. It's inside of you. You can do it. First Chronicles 16.11, it says, look to the Lord in His strength. Seek His face always because God is the one who has the ultimate strength. But you have the ability to fight. You're not weak. The second thing is called dumb luck circumstances. Do you ever know what dumb luck is? That's like just a, man, you got lucky kind of thing. And they call this the golden hour. So understand the golden hour is the moment in time where you need to do something. Because first off, God gives you the ability to fight, right? He gives you the strength to do something. But now there's that time frame is what are you going to do? It's the 90 seconds of survival. What are you going to do? Are you going to get God involved? Are you going to freeze? Are you going to fight? Are you going to fight? What are you going to do? That is called the golden hour. And the last thing is the miracle of faith. That's what Christian calls God's providence in your life. That's when he moves. If Gideon is going to defeat his foes, we go back to our text. How is he going to do it? God is going to do it. God is going to give him wholeness, soundness, and peace. That's what shalom means. Shalom means everything that you need in life. I close with this last thought. What Gideon did after which I find the most impactful of all of this, is that he tore down the altar. See, what happens is when you and I live in so much fear, when we live in so much uncertainty, anxiety, what we do is we always build up this altar. And what an altar is, it's like that place you run back to. 
It's like, oh, I don't know what to do. And you run back and say, okay, well, I'm safe here, which is away from everything. I'm going to live in this own corner. Nobody's going to bother me. And you just live in your own world. And I'm going to tell you that world that you live in is so tormenting. Like, nothing's going to get better, but you always go back to it. But here we're talking about here is what Gideon did is he tore down the altar of Baal, that old altar that they would always worship. Judges 6.25, it says, That same night the Lord said to him, Take a second bull from your father's herd, a seven-year-old, and tear down the father's altar of Baal. Cut it down and then build a proper altar. If you really understand what I'm saying here, is that, man, we have old altars in life. How many can say amen, man? You got some old altars. I mean, you tell you, you got old religion. You got old thoughts, old thinking, old ways of doing things. It's time to tear that down. Because if it's still up, the temptation is always going to be to go back and worship the old things. But God tells Gideon, go tear it down and build a proper altar. And what that proper altar is, is always God. It's always God. Build the right altar in life. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. That's the glory of God. God gives you the peace that you absolutely need in life. Nothing else will ever satisfy. No other altar that uh, you had in the past could ever satisfy. Just like the people in Gideon, nothing that they were doing was working. But when God gets on the scene, how many know that's when things help? I close with this last story. It's called the Trauma Survivor Reunion. There's a, a hospital that they do this thing every single year where families come after, you know, people get involved in car accidents, people get involved in traumatic events, and the, the nurses, the doctors save their lives. So what they did was every year they, uh, they hold this reunion where they come together. So the families come together, the nurses come together, and it's like, man, you're the one who saved my life. You helped me. And I'm going to show you just a few pictures very quickly, okay? I'm going to walk over here. Don't mind me. Don't mind me. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to read what happens. I got three of them. Hallelujah. You're following along, right? We're all good. Here we go. This is the first one here. So this man right here you're seeing here, his name is Kevin. He was 33, old, 33 years old. He was involved in a motorcycle accident. He was thrown 100 feet and he was rushed to Long Beach Medical Center where the care team, the trauma center, saved his life. Another one here is a four-year-old Jeremiah. He was treated at the trauma center after being balled in the face by a dog. The trauma uh, survivors, they saved this little boy's life. And the last one here is called the Para Brothers. And they say here is that they've been cared for after they were uh, saved from a life-changing car accident. These are people that have survived a traumatic event. But who saved them was a trauma care center. I'm telling you, our trauma care center is none other than Jesus Christ, none other than God. Your soul might be tormented today. And you might be thinking, how can I go on any longer? What am I going to do in life? I'm telling you, Jesus Christ, you give your life to Him, you will find nothing but peace. Peace I give to you, and peace I leave you. How many know that's good hope? God, Jehovah Shalom, that's who we serve. If we could do one thing, let's go ahead and bow our, uh, bow our heads, close our eyes, respecting our neighbor and all those around us. Hallelujah. God is good, and He's worthy to be praised. Amen. We serve a really good God. So real quickly, you might be right now living in a moment of fear, unknowingness. The reason why is because you don't have God, you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
Right now you're being tormented in your mind. Whatever it may be. It could be unforgiveness. It could be bitterness. It could be so many aspects of life. And right now you live in this moment separated from God. But what God did for us is beyond comprehension. What Jesus Christ did on the cross is beyond comprehension. How God had to show himself was to become a man so that he could die on the cross for our sins. God wants to be real to you today. And God brought you here because he wants to make himself known to you so that you can know the living God. And your peace, your, your heart can be finally settled in peace. You can stop living your own means and doing things your own way because if you're being honest here, you know right now it's not going so well. Because you're doing life all by yourself. God wants to be real. He wants to make himself known. So I ask you very quickly, if you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never bowed your knee to the King of Kings, but you want to do that today. You want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You need this. You need God desperately. You need peace inside your soul, inside your mind, and inside your heart. You need this and you want this. I ask you quickly. I want to pray with you. I want you to do one thing. You raise your hand in this place. I want to pray with you. You want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Amen. I see your hand. But will there be anybody else in this place? God is speaking to you today. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me. You will find rest. The world will never give you rest. Only God will. Hallelujah. Now to the backslider. The backslider is somebody who walked with God. You walked with God at one point. You gave your life to him. But right now you are not living for God. Right now you are living in a place of, uh, man, you don't know how, how this is going to work out. You don't know what's going to happen in life. Uh, and, you know, you say, well, what, what are you going to do, God? Well, God wants to help you. But you got to bring him back into the circle of your life. So if you're backslidden, you're not right with God. You want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You raise your hand quickly. Only you to a simple prayer. Amen. I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? Don't leave this place regretting that you did not come to God. It's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that I have prayed. Man, God, tell me, God has helped me. Hallelujah. Real quickly, not saved. Backslidden. You want to come to God. You want to put away religious thoughts. You want to... To tear down the altars of the past and build up new ones. Real quick, raise your hand. I want to pray with you real fast. Amen. If you meant that, I want you to do one thing. You look at me very quickly. You meant that right. I want to pray with you real quick. I want you to stand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you, uh, you know, tell your life story. Can you come up here and meet me? I want to pray with you very fast. Both of you, both of you, both of you. Both of you. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to shame you. This is what God wants to do in your life, okay? I want you to repeat after me, okay?
God, I pray for your people this day, Lord God, that you would touch them supernaturally. God, I speak deliverance in their lives, Lord God. Help them to know that you are God. Help them to know that you are King. God, speak on to them this day. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, you are mighty, Lord. You are awesome in power. I so thank you, God, for your grace and mercy. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we so thank you. Oh, blessed be your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, my God, my King. You are righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give God praise in this place. She Hallelujah, God. We so thank you for the love. We so thank you, God, for your grace and mercy. Amen. Before we go, very quickly, if you are dealing with uh, uh, just that pressure of, um, you know, we can go, uh, and I don't want to reveal it. You don't have to reveal anything. You know what I mean? But if you feel like you are oppressed, and that can go on into many avenues, it can go to depression, it can go from pressure of bills, it could go to just temptation, it could go all, it, we could go on, but if you feel oppressed, meaning that man, you feel like when you wake up, oh, how am I going to do this? You go to bed and say, oh, you, you feel like you can't sleep at night, you feel like, man, I, you need to take pills to go to sleep, or you're on your phone all night long trying to find peace. God wants to give you perfect peace because that's what shalom means. Shalom means perfect peace. So I'm going to pray with anybody who is going through something like that. I, I want to meet you right here and I'm going to pray with you very quickly. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Come out of your seat. I'm going to pray with you very fast. Anybody else, don't be ashamed. You feel oppressed. You feel like, dang, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And, you know, whatever it is, financially. You know what I mean? Don't don't leave this place saying, I wish I prayed. I wish I went up there. I wish I had, you know. Tell me God can help me. Amen. There we go. There we go. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. God is good. God is good. What you do right now is you're allowing God to get involved. That's what you're doing. You're allowing God to get involved in your life. Now I'm telling you, how many know we need God involved? We need God involved. When we do things ourselves, it don't work out. But we get God involved in those things. Hallelujah. Anybody else? One more call. Don't leave this place saying, dang, I wish I got up and got prayer. God wants to help you. He's going to set people free today. Hallelujah. Okay. I'm going to lead you into a simple prayer because when you're a Christian, God gives you authority. He gives you dominion. And he gives you perfect peace. Peace I give to you and peace I leave you. God wants to give that. Okay? God's going to break some, some things today. Okay? So I want you to go ahead and repeat after me. I want you to mean it with your heart. Okay, lift up your hands and we're going to pray. Just repeat after me. Say, God, I come before you with my fear, with my anxiety. I give it to you. You defeated all sin, all my pain. You defeated it on the cross. In this day, I lay it at your feet. I tear down my past. I build up a new altar with peace. Help me, God. Give me your perfect peace. I declare it this day in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray for you, God. I ask your hand to be upon them, Lord God. I ask you to give them peace. Uh, give them understanding, Lord God. Move right now, Lord God. Uh, give them, Lord God, your perfect peace. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give God praise in this place. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you are good. Hallelujah. Amen. We serve a good God. Thank you all for coming. Come back tonight if you can. We're going to be here at 7 o'clock. God is good. He really does help us. So let's go ahead and praise as God to help us as we go. And again, thank you all for this. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place. God, bring us back safely at the next time. In Jesus' name, amen.